Hi, all this is your Professor Ian. This is um, my second uh, lecture on the Odyssey. So in the first lecture, I just kind of gave a broad overview, looked at some of the characters, uh, the basic plot. So in this uh, lecture, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some more thematic matters. And we're going to start by discussing the differences between the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's a good way to think about what's happening in the Odyssey, especially thematically. We're going to talk about five big differences, the geography, the timeline, the characters, the female characters, and the theme in general of these two works. Because as we're going to see, they're very different, um, uh, very different works in many ways. So let's start with the geography. Um, so the Iliad is all set outside the Trojan walls when we have the scenes with the Greeks, uh, you know, and say um, uh, Achilles is uh, listening to, uh, listening to Odysseus and Phoenix who come to talk to him and try to convince him to go back fighting, right? Or that beginning scene where Agamemnon and Achilles are fighting. This is all by the ships in the, the Greeks camp outside the Trojan walls, right? Remember here is Troy up here. So they're, out, so they're camped outside the walls in their, their you know, uh, army formations ready to try to um, take the city. Uh, and then we have scenes inside the city walls when we flash to Hector and uh, Paris and things like this. And Mount Olympus when we have the gods uh, discussing and debating the matter. Um, but really just the three settings for the most part um, in the Iliad. That's really all there is to it. It's a very centralized kind of story. We don't get the backstory. Uh, we don't get after the war. It's all centered around Troy. Very much the story of Achilles at uh, Troy. Um, the Odyssey, on the other hand, takes place in a kind of fantastic version of the Greek world. Uh, and, you know, I posted a map that you can take a look at that kind of charts a, a, uh, an idea of what his journey might have looked like. But there is no, like, uh, way to map his journey onto the actual geography of Greece. People have tried, but nobody can agree that, okay, when he says he goes here, he, you know, Calypso's Island, that must be, that must be Crete. He must be, you know, he must be in that or... Uh, Cytheria or something like that. It just not doesn't um, doesn't track that way. So it's this kind of fantastic version of the Greek world, but there's a ton of locations in the Odyssey, um, many locations, even Hades. Right? He goes uh, and at least sees a vision of Hades, if not go down to the actual underworld itself. Um, some and like I said, some experts will argue that the places are meant to represent real places, but there's no way to accurately map them like a one-to-one -one correlation. Like this place must be this place. Right. Uh, rather, what you should think about is just the fact that he's visiting these places that are non-Greek. Right. Um, and that's one of the interesting things. The Iliad. Right. They're trying to take Troy. And remember, Troy is basically Troy and the Trojans. They're basically Greeks. They're kind of like cousins to the Greeks. Um, you know, these are all Greek settlements uh, eventually. Right. Uh, Greece eventually takes over all this land. Um, in the Age of Heroes, the Mycenaean Age, where the, the, the Iliad is set and the Odyssey is set, this Greece wasn't this giant powerhouse, right? Greece is more in here and with some colonies over here. Um, but these are basically, the Trojans are basically cousins to the Greeks that they're fighting, right? The Achaeans. Um, you know, they have the same customs, the same understanding of one-on-one -on -one combat and, uh, you know, honor and all these things. They have the same gods, right? Poseidon and Apollo like the Trojans, right? Uh, Athena and Hera like the Greeks, but, you know, they have the same gods. So it's, it's like, um, you know, it's like almost, I, I won't say a civil war, but it's definitely, you know, uh, people who know each other fighting each other over this perceived wrong and in, in this actual wrong with Paris taking away Helen, right? This, this crime against uh, the laws of hospitality and, and um, you know, other things too, right? Um, but this big uh, breach of the laws of Xenia resulting in this war, but it's very much a uh, war of people who know each other. Whereas in the Odyssey, it's very much the opposite, right? This is very much Odysseus encountering the non-Greeks, the others, right? The, the foreigners um, as he travels around this fantastic world. So there's this basic difference in the two uh, stories in terms of geography uh, that is very important. As well, um, there's a big difference in the way the story is told and framed through time. Uh, the Iliad, if you like, um, plot out the the action of the story, it takes about 50 days. The actual story of the Iliad. It's a very condensed kind of uh, story, right? You know, the anger of, of Achilles when his war 
prize is taken from him by Agamemnon to, you know, Patroclus is killed and then he gets revenge uh, and, and, and fights Hector and drags the body around and eventually Priam comes and gets the body back. That all takes about 50 days, more or less, right? Um, you know, this is after nine years of war, uh, the Greeks against the Trojans, sacking cities and, and trying to storm the, the Trojans, the, the city of Troy itself. But this is almost unmentioned in the Iliad itself. This is all the backstory. And, you know, in, in book one, you can tell you know, um, Achilles is kind of weary of the war. He even says, you know, I have, I have no beef against these these Trojan spearmen. Why, why are we even here, right? And Odysseus seems kind of uh, tired with the whole thing later, right? Everybody's a little tired of the war by the time the Iliad even, Iliad even takes place. So then it's told in this very linear fashion, right? That it doesn't skip around in time. We don't get flashbacks. We flash to the gods sometimes. We flash to Hector sometimes and, and um, you know, Paris inside the city of Troy. But it's all very much a linear, um, chronologically ordered structure to the story. The Odyssey is very different. Uh, it tells Odysseus's entire 10-year voyage. So we have 10 years instead of 50 days. And he uses stories to flash to past events. And in fact, you know, when we start the Odyssey, we're already seven years into, or nine, no, sorry, nine years into um, the uh, return home. He's already been, he's been gone for 19 years, Odysseus, and it's, it's like nine years after the, the war at uh, Troy, and he's been trapped on Calypso's Island for seven years. So when we first meet uh, Odysseus in book five, he's already been on Calypso's Island for seven years, and a few years before that, returning home. And then he doesn't, you know, we learn all this backstory, this previous nine years after he leaves Calypso's Island. And, you know, he's uh, he's telling some people his story at a banquet. Uh, and he's just regaling them with stories about these crazy adventures he's had. But it's a very different kind of um, uh, time structure. The Iliad is very much a straightforward kind of adventure, war narrative, whereas the Odyssey is very much uh, a very different thing. It's, 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 it's framed very differently. And Odysseus is framed as a storyteller in, in the Odyssey, right? He's, it's not just his story being related by Homer in this kind of like, you know, uh, third person. Instead, a lot of this is Odysseus telling his own story, which is an interesting difference uh, in terms of thinking about their, their agency in, in the story, right? So the time is very different. Characters are different. So in the Iliad, um, all the characters are either humans or gods, uh, and some, you know, I guess like in between, like Achilles is, you know, half god, and Seraphan is the, a son of Zeus, and so on and so forth. We have some, some, you know, demigods, but it's humans and gods, um, right? These are all great heroes, the humans, right? They're these kind of epic heroes. So we have like Ajax the Greater, who's this like giant of a man and, and stronger than um, humans actually are. Sorry. So the humans are kind of these super super powered uh, heroes in a way, but it's just the, one of the conventions of epic poetry. They are humans. Um, again, the Trojans and the Achaeans, the the Nans, the Greeks, right? They're all basically the same group of people, the same ethnicity, ethnic uh, group of people, right? A little bit different, kind of like cousins, but again, humans and gods. That's basically all uh, we have in the Iliad. Right, and they they interact and they they fight each other at times, but that's all we have. The Odyssey, um, human gods play the main roles again. We have the same kind of structure where the the humans are struggling through obstacles in the world, and the gods are kind of playing the role of the you know they're they're against and for the humans at different times, and they you know blow the winds of fate against them. Right, Poseidon definitely has it out for Odysseus in this book. Um, but we also have witches and monsters and uh, sea creatures and all kinds of other uh, non-human players um, in the Odyssey. Uh, and this is what I was talking about before. Odysseus encounters many non-Greek people, right? Again, in the Iliad, it's all basically Greek people. The Trojans are just a different kind of Greek people, just like I said, cousins, basically. Uh, whereas in uh, in the Odyssey, he encounters uh, cannibals, he encounters lotus eaters, which are these kind of like foreign people. He encounters, uh, you know, the Cyclops and uh, Circe and Calypso. Calypso is a kind of minor goddess, um, and Circe sometimes is called a minor goddess, but she's more of a witch figure. But anyways, you know, he's meeting all kinds of different people, and um, 
what's interesting here is that they don't share the same kind of uh, values, right? He almost gets eaten by cannibals. Uh, the Lotus Eaters have a very different understanding of the world, right? So it's very much him encountering these other groups that have different cultural backgrounds and different cultural ideas. And that's what the Odyssey, the focus of the Odyssey is more about that, right? About him navigating uh, these, these other peoples and dealing with them. Um, uh, many more characters, right? Uh, and some of these characters only appear in the Odyssey, right? Or appear in a unique form in the Odyssey, which is, it's a fun thing about the Odyssey is that some of the creatures we see, like Scylla and uh, the Sirens and um, even the Cyclops is a different a different version of the Cyclops. But we get a lot of unique monsters, you know, the Lotus Eaters and the, the cannibals he encounters. These are not big figures in, in Greek mythology. You know, they seem to be almost created whole cloth for uh, the Odyssey as these unique monsters for him to encounter. Whereas the Iliad, I mean, the Iliad, all the characters you're reading about are pretty well known, right? Ajax and Ajax the Lesser, Agamemnon, Menelaus. These are all characters that are, are well known in, in Greek mythology. And so this is kind of like the greatest heroes uh, assembled for this drama, whereas the Odyssey has him going to these, these different places encountering different things that aren't a big part of Greek mythology. So different in characters, uh, difference in female characters, uh, especially, right? Um, you know, the Iliad has some strong central female characters. Uh, if you read uh, Hector's wife has some great speeches in, uh, I think it's book six, if I remember correctly. I'd have to take a, oh yeah, right, I have it right here. Okay, yeah, um, right. She's trying to warn Hector like, hey, you, you shouldn't go to fight uh, in this war. You have a family, you're going to, you're going to lose everything if you die, and you're probably going to die if you go ahead and fight. Then you're going to lose your family. Everything you're fighting for is going to be lost. So it's kind of like a, a fool's a fool's errand to go ahead and fight. You're going to lose your the only thing you'll get. You'll, the only thing you'll keep is your honor, right? You'll lose your family and your life. Everything you 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 want to build in your life will be gone. So, anyways, she has some great lines. Uh, Helen has some great lines, right? There are some strong female characters. Um, but at the same time, in the Odyssey, I would argue we have even stronger female characters. We have uh, Penelope, Penelope especially, right? She's the wife of um, uh, Odysseus, and she's very much this the kind of equal to um, Odysseus uh, in this very interesting way. She's she's very much presented that way. She's like the ideal wife who remains faithful. She's able to keep these these uh, avarice suitors away from her, right? She's very much is equal and in book 23, which we're going to read together, you're gonna to see her put him to the test uh, at the end before he can rec reclaim his, his throne. So she has this, um, this way of testing him. Um, so there's stronger female characters, but in the Odyssey, we also have um, a lot of monstrous female figures that stand in his way, right? Circe and Calypso amongst others. But it seems like a lot of uh, Odysseus's problems in the Odyssey are female, are depicted as female, which is really interesting because he has to get back to this strong female figure of Penelope by overcoming these other monstrous and, and tempting uh, female figures. He, he sleeps with both Circe and Calypso in his, his struggle to get back to uh, Penelope. So, you know, part of Part of the obstacle these monstrous women at times is uh, has a, like a sexual component, right? So there's this really interesting um, gender thing going on in uh, the Odyssey, which isn't really present in the Iliad, right? The Iliad has these strong female characters, but it's much more about uh, men fighting men and talking about honor and such. So I just wanted to end this part of the lecture talking about another um, Greek value, arete. Uh, spelled with a little chapeau over the E. Um, there's no real exact English translation. You find different things if you look it up. It's a kind of combination of excellence, virtue, and valor. Sometimes people talk about it as a kind of like reaching your full potential. Um, it's just about like being excellent in life, uh, no matter what that means to you as an individual. Odysseus displays Arete and his, you know, his combination of intelligence piety, right? He's very faithful to Athena and his physical ability. He's also a great warrior. Although, as we see with the, the Cyclops, sometimes he screws things up. Uh, and the good women, especially Penelope, display this kind of arete. And there's just a, a little picture of Penelope staying faithful to Odysseus. Uh, and that's it for now. I'll continue this in a minute.